unsolved problem, by the way, of why his name was Henry Victor Dyson Dyson. His name was originally Henry Victor Dyson Tannenbaum. And his father, whose name was obviously Tannenbaum, who was an Austrian Jew uh, who came to England and uh, married a woman named Dyson and uh, changed his name by D. Paul in 1905 when uh, Hugo was eight years old to Dyson. And therefore, Henry Victor Dyson Tannenbaum became Henry Victor Dyson Dyson, if you wonder why he had the <laughs> double name. Um, in any case, um, I was going to write a paper this year on Lord David Cecil, but then I got to thinking about a, another subject of mine that interested me over the years, which is the collaboration between Ronald Tolkien and C.S. Lewis uh, that was to be called Language and Human Nature, which was supposed to come out sometime during the war years, published supposedly by the Student Christian Movement Press. And so I switched my attention to yet another inkling, Charles Wren, who was, like Lewis and Tolkien, a historian, an historian of the English language, like Tolkien himself, an Anglo-Saxonist, in fact, who succeeded Tolkien in 1945-46 as Ellington and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon in the University of Oxford. So the two seem to uh, come together. The um, collaboration with Tolkien was, um, Lewis once said, scheduled to appear along about the Talons of Greece, a good classical equivalent of the 12th of never or the 31st of November. Um, it seems to me that the student Christian movement, an avowedly Protestant uh, organization, was a weird choice for Lewis collaboration with Tolkien, who was anything but a Protestant, and I think maybe there was a little bit of Lewis's habitual tone deafness to uh, Roman Catholics, and particularly Tolkien Roman Catholicism there. However, the general question that they wanted to talk about was the question of language and uh, human nature. Some early uh, notes of Lewis on the subject have uh, come to light recently and been published a few years ago in seven. Um, does the possession of language, in fact, define what constitutes humanity? And also, there's a second question. Does the, do different parts of humanity, different peoples, uh, are, is their difference reflected in the differences in their languages? In other words, the question of language and human nature can be considered both globally and uh, locally. Now, I'm assuming that Lewis did, in fact, have the intention of writing such a book in collaboration with Tolkien. He produced what we might call materials toward the outline of an argument for language and human nature. We have uh, some, at least, of materials. But back when Professor Tolkien <coughs> was still living with Edith virtually incommunicado near Bournemouth in the late 60s and early 70s, I asked Christopher to ask his father about the collaboration. In a letter to me dated 25 March 1972, he responded that, according to his father, there were no data whatsoever surviving of the collaboration. Christopher told me he wasn't sure how well his father could remember the matter at all though he was sure the project was a brainchild of C.S. Lewis's, and that it began and ended, Ronald Tolkien's words, as a pious hope. <laughs> Professor Tolkien said that he, if he ever did write anything, which he did not remember doing, he would have given it to Lewis, who would have burned it. <laughs> well, that's a little misleading. But apparently, as Christopher remarked, to me, certain papers of his father's, which had been in Lewis's possession as of November 22, 1963, 
never reappeared after Lewis's death, perhaps going the way of, among other manuscripts, Lewis's own copies of Box's materials. Some scholars have doubted Walter Hooper's story of rescuing items from the fire after Lewis's death. I do not doubt it. Um, we have material of Lewis's from the collaboration, so we started it. The project existed in his mind and beginning on paper. Certainly Tolkien discussed it with Lewis, and he certainly, and in fact both of them certainly discussed the topic with uh, Charles Wren. The most interesting word to me in what Christopher quotes from his father is the word pious. Now I'm sure the phrase pious hope generally means simply an unlikely though wished for outcome. But Tolkien sometimes used words so exactly as to constitute a Tolkienian pun, and I believe this is the case, piety in the ordinary religious sense was involved. The purpose, or at least the milieu of the question, was religious. I'm also assuming that the subject of the proposed collaboration was at least approximately that suggested by the proposed title. I say this because Lewis's insistence in the fragment that the speaker of the language must know what he is saying suggests to me a line of thought going off over hill and dale from uh, the student Christian movement press to the Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge and their interest back in the 1930s and 1940s in the phenomenon of speaking in tongues, involving in some cases the existence of a heavenly or holy uh, language. Now, Lewis, in that idiot strength, does refer to the possibility of a uh, hellish language, but uh, he never quite um, came out and separated the possibility of a heavenly language from his uh, older soul, which we'll get into in a moment. Now, my friend Colin Havard has observed, in a paper that I think was published in Mithlore, that his father was the only scientist among the Inklings, and that is, in the general sense of the word science, is certainly true, but there were at least two Inklings who were interested in the sciences of language, and neither of them was C.S. Lewis. Uh, one was Tolkien, of course, his strictures on Lewis's cavalier and anti-scientific treatment of technical materials Tolkien had supplied him with for the entry uh, on uh, Fierce's nature in uh, Studies and Words are well known and uh, revealing. Um, in his letter to Christopher from 12 September 60, I wrote for Lewis a long analysis of the semantics and formal history of Astor's PHU with special reference to Fierce's all that remains is the first nine lines with the characteristic intrusion of beards and cucumbers. The rest is dismissed with, we have not a shred of evidence. He remains at best and worst an Oxford classical don when dealing with words. So Tolkien gave Lewis a long semantic and formal, that is technical analysis, and Lewis turned it into a humorous, in his view, throwaway. In this connection, we should probably call to mind Lewis's own comments in his Surprise by Joy that he frankly could not really do the math that was necessary for science, that uh, although when he was a child reading Lubbock's Ants, Bees, and Wasps, he developed for a short time a genuine scientific interest in insects. <coughs> of course, if you go past the schoolboy interest, um, then uh, there does come in, and we know that the only way Lewis got into Oxford to get his degree first and all was by the serviceman position and the maths requirement after the World War. When you have a response twice a year. Um, the other inkling, besides Tolkien, was a serious interest in language and nature. Lord, according to the Tolkienian view, was the other C.W., Charles L. Wren. Wren, Anglo-Saxonist and Tolkien's successor as professor, Ellington Bosworth professor, was, as noted, mostly absent from the evenings during the war years, 
living in London most of the time. But Lewis noted Wren's desire, and this is one of the interesting and unexplored uh, notes on early, that is, um, pre-1940 Inklings. Um, he noted uh, Wren's desire, it's best not perhaps quite seriously, to burn Charles Williams at the stake. <laughs> And we know he was there uh, sometimes during the uh, early part of the war, as well as when Lewis was uh, writing and uh, uh, reciting, uh, reading out of the silent planet before the war. The passage on Burning Williams comes from a letter Lewis wrote to his brother in November 1939. Um, had a pleasant evening Thursday with Williams, Tolkien, and Wren, during which Wren almost seriously expressed a strong wish to burn Williams, or at least um, maintain that conversation with Williams enabled him to understand how inquisitors had felt it right to burn people. <laughs> Tolkien and I agreed afterwards that we knew just what he meant, that as some people in school are eminently pickable, so Williams is eminently combustible. <laughs> the occasion was a discussion of the most distressing text in the Bible, narrowed the way and few there are to find it and whether one could really believe in a universe where the majority were doomed, and also in the goodness of God. Wren, of course, took the view that it mattered precisely nothing whether it confirmed to your idea of goodness or not, and it was at this point that the combustible possibilities of Williams revealed themselves to him in an attractive light. The general sense of the meeting was in favor of a view on the lines taken in Pastor Pastorum, that our Lord's replies are never straight answers and never gratify curiosity. And whatever this one meant, its purpose was certainly not statistical. There's another reference to Van in a long letter to uh, Warney in November 1939. That evening, Canon Fox had lectured his professor of poetry. Williams Hopkins, his colleague at the press and nephew of the poet, Wren and I met. And falling into <coughs> the uh, <coughs> mention of it by chance, read about half of the novel Irene Ainsley right through. When you do it like that, instead of picking out the plums, it turns out to have a kind of nightmare reality. Indeed, the characters are all from such primitive savages that it would be quite sinister if the absurdity of the presentation were not always resolving the whole thing into laughter. That was one of Lewis's uh, favorite occupations uh, with meetings of the Inklings when things got too serious that they would read a, as long a passage from Irene uh, Isley, Isley, an 1897 novel by Amanda McKittrick Ross, whose solicitor had been Lewis's father, so he had a presentation first edition of the, <laughs> the book, which, so far as I know, did not during her life go into a second edition, and her life lasted another 42 years. Uh, it is probably the worst written novel ever written. <laughs> um, there, you know, I had a writer, uh, a, an English teacher, who used to write on my papers, block that adjective. Well, nobody blocked any of those. <laughs> there are strings of them. Something may happen in between the strings of adjectives, but it's not exactly clear what. In any case, uh, they, uh, that was one, another thing they did uh, at the Inklings. And then there's a letter to Warney in May 1940, in which Wren is listed as having arrived at Lewis's uh, rooms after Humphrey Havard and uh, Williams and Tolkien, but the discussion is not mentioned. So we don't have any evidence of what uh, uh, they discussed when Wren was there, but then, of course, Warney came home, and there was no need to write letters from C.S. Lewis to his brother, uh, telling him what happened to the Inklings, because he was there. Mm -hmm. The next mention we have of Wren uh, is in a letter from uh, uh, Tolkien to Christopher in 1946, after Wren returned from his stint at the University of London. Uh, we had a ham feast with C.S. Lewis on Thursday an American ham from Dr. Furore of Johns Hopkins University, and it was like a glimpse of old times, quiet and rational, since Hugo Dyson was not invited. 
CSL asked Wren, and it was a great success since it pleased him, and he was very pleasant, a good step towards weaning him from academic politics. All right, now, we can look, I think we should look, for a clue as to what was happening in the field and with the Inklings on this question of language and human nature during the time that Lewis and Tolkien were supposed to be collaborating. Um, several passages in uh, Rand's writings, including his presidential address to the Comparative Literature Society way late in the 60s, provide keys to his concerns. From the English language in 1949, we find that language is the expression of human personality in words, whether written or spoken. It will be taken for granted, therefore, that language as defined above is the normal, right, natural, and uh, enduring method of expressing the human mind, which is nearest to universal. Language would then mean both language in general and any particular language, considered quite apart from any actual speaker or situation. Um, and then he goes on to discuss the difference between inner and uh, outer language, and which is some, uh, inner language sometimes being called speech. And he gives an example of differences between different kinds of human circles. It may be said that the French cheval, the Italian cavallo, and the Russian con all mean horse, and the words for horse can be interchanged in translating from one of those languages into another. But when one remembers how differently the same general notion of horse is inwardly felt and apprehended by different uh, nations, one can see that from the standpoint of the speech or inner language, the four words cited for horse are not really interchangeable in translation at all. This sets up, helps set up the two meanings we've suggested for language and human nature, the global and the local. If you read Wren, however, there seems to be a possible third, something in between the other, situation and quid, um, and that's what briefly what Kenneth Jenkin would call its quiddity. This comes to light when we look at, or when Wren looks at, the problem of translation. Um, and he quotes uh, Karl Vossler, uh, one of the now little regarded idealist schools of linguists, who has, uh, was very interested, interesting to, uh, to Wren. Um, and beside this horse cavallo problem might be noted uh, Lewis's works, uh, words on the word ship from uh, Surprise by Joy. The very formula, nous means a ship, is wrong. Nous and ship both mean a thing. They do not mean one another. Behind nous is, as behind nous or naka, we want to have a picture of the dark, slender mass with sail or oars, climbing the ridges with no officious English word intruding. He recognizes what Wren has characterized as the horse cavallo question and the interchangeability of words, and though he doesn't do anything with it, we can see how his view fits in with Tolkien and languages are the chief distinguishing marks of peoples, and with Wren on the limited possibilities of translation. They're agreed pretty much there. However, um, after this time, before this time, Ogden and Richards uh, defined what they called scientific symbolic language, by the, which they meant indicative speech. Since this time, Noam Chomsky and the Englishman Alan Gardner and John Lyons attempted a science of linguistics as opposed perhaps to what we might call a philological science. One could say that Wren was more open to this kind of science than Tolkien was interested in being. Perhaps we can say that Tolkien was interested both in the science and the uh, romance of words, witness his remarks on cellar door. If we go back to Wren's early paper on standard old English, that's 1933, we find that opening with the words, before enjoying the privilege of addressing the philological society on a fundamental 
um, problem of English linguistic science, I find it to be most fitting that I should pay a tribute to the man to whom, above all others, the scientific study of English in general and Old English in particular um, owes most. The man, of course, is Henry Sweet, and it is good to be reminded of the greatness of that quirky, sometimes querulous, even quarrelsome man. But beyond that, the passage is important for its double use of science and scientific, as well as for a reference later to Sweet's less scientific successors. We can see that Rand is striving for science and language. Tolkien accepts it, and Lewis, to some extent at least, strives against. I might mention, I've written, I wrote a number of letters to a number of inklings, but the only letter I ever wrote Wren was to thank him for his old English grammar, and regretting I could not write Henry Sweet for his primer, about the same time I wrote Sir Frank Stanton to thank him for his Anglo-Saxon England, because at that point I was going to be an Anglo-Saxonist myself. Uh, I had no idea Wren was even associated with the Englands. Um, the only personal contact I ever had with any C.L. Wren was with Charles Lewis Wren, the Norwalk, Connecticut book illustrator and artist, at an uh, exhibition of his works in South Norwalk. So I do know at least that our Charles Leslie Wren is listed, when Charles Leslie Wren is listed as the illustrator, as he is on a number of internet sites, that's flat wrong. Make a note. <laughs> um, let's follow a uh, matter of translation a little further. Um, here is the source of one of the last pieces of uh, Redden's writing, the Presidential Address of the Modern Humanities Research Association, um, the idea of comparative literature. He gives us, as possibly successful examples of translation, the version of the Old English Seafarer produced by Ezra Pound, Fitzgerald's Omar Khayyam, Pasternak's translations of the poetry of the Georgian Brzezinski, and Arnold's rendering of Celtic poetry for his lectures on the study of Celtic literature. His remarks on Pasternak's method are worth quoting. Pasternak, being one of the great poets of the era, used his intimate friendship with certain Georgian poets to soak himself, as it were, into their poetic spirit. Then, by using literal renderings, renderings of the poem approved by the authors themselves, he was able to create some of his finest poetry though he knew not a word of Georgian. And Pound Seafarer is really a new poem. And at least a shadowing of the conversations or intermittent conversation between Lewis and Tolkien that led to the proposal for language and human nature may be found conveniently in Out of the Silent Planet and one important uh, passage in Paralandra and in Tolkien's rejoinders in Out of the Talk of the Planet and what which was the uh, Notion Club papers in uh, Sauron Defeated. Here's a passage from Paralandra. Didn't I tell you about that, said Ransom, scientifically? Yeah, right. It is one of the most interesting things about the whole affair. It appears we were quite mistaken in thinking press of love the peculiar speech of Mars. It is really what may be called old solar, love Arabola of Cordy. There was originally a common speech for all rational creatures inhabiting the planets of our system, those who were ever inhabited, I mean. That original speech was lost on Solcandra, our own world, when the whole tragedy took place. No human language now known in the world is descended from it. Note Lewis's use of the word scientifically for what Tolkien asserts through his character Raymer uh, cannot, in fact, be considered scientific at all. There's an interesting footnote, interesting to me anyway, on that name Raymer that uh, uh, Tolkien gives to one of his characters in the uh, in uh, the Notion Club papers, one of the members of the uh, Notion Club, the Inklings. Um, Rame is a Middle English word for ransom. Um, I think, perhaps, that the character is intended as Tolkien's counterfigure to Lewis's ransom. I recall as an English major at Yale a few years ago, quite a few, writing for the Lit, a uh, 
Pop Kinsian poem, including the phrase Christ Raymond in Maymas, with the pun on Raymond equaling ransom and Raymond equaling dressed. Raymond's response to Ransom's statement follows from I think there might be an old human or a primitive Adamic. Certainly was one, though it's not certain that all our language derived from it in unbroken continuity. The only um, undoubted common inheritance is the aptitude for making words, the compelling need to make them. But the old human could not possibly be the same as the prime language of other differently constituted rational animals, such as Lewis and Swasso. Because these two embodiments, men and Rosa, are quite different, and the physical basis which conditions the symbol forms would be aboriginally different. The mind-body blends would have quite different expressive flavors. The expression might not take vocal or even audible form at all. Without symbols, you have no language, and language begins only with incarnation and not before it. But of course, if you're going to confuse language with forms of thought, you might perhaps talk about old soul, but why not old universal? If this were all we had, we could see already a fundamental disagreement between the scientists, Tolkien and Stilmore Graham, who are concerned with the fact that human speech is in fact specifically human, from human beings and folks and mouths, as well as human minds and brains. And the philosopher Lewis, who is more concerned, we might say, with thought forms, and who goes on, goes so far as to say in that hideous strength that in his old soul, or eventually called the great language, the meaning is inherent in the language. You may recall the passage in uh, that hideous strength. And Dimble, who had been sitting with his face drawn and rather white between the white faces of the two women and his eyes on the table, raised his head, and great syllables of words that sounded like castles came out of his mouth. Jane felt her heart leap and quiver at them. Everything else in the room seemed to have been intensely quiet, even the bird and the bear and cat were still staring at the speaker. The voice did not sound like Dimbles. It was as if the words spoke themselves through him from some strong place at a distance or as if they were not words at all, but present operations of God, the planets, and the ten dragon. For this was the language spoken before the fall and beyond the moon, and its meanings were not given to the syllables by chance, or skill, or long tradition, but truly inherent in them, as the shape of the great sun is inherent in the little water drop. Well, it's a great romantic state. Scientific, I don't think I would call it. It's also a passage that took me by storm. In fact, uh, one of the very first articles I read, I wrote on the uh, on Lewis and on Lewis and Tolkien was called Words That Sound Like Castles. Um, we have Lewis out of the Silent Planet discoursing on the difference between the speech of the Aldilla and the physical beings like uh, Man and Frosa, even though they are speaking the same language. We have Wren on redness and the horse cavallo uh, problems. Um, the Russian word for red is, if I remember correctly, krasny, and the uh, word for beautiful is prosivhi and flekrasny, and uh, the Czech word krasny is uh, the word for both redness and beauty. So there seems to be some kind of Slavonic connection of redness and uh, and beauty, which does not occur in anything else except possibly long towards the Awasa, which is a strange proposal. Um, okay, and um, we have Tolkien in the Notion Club papers suggesting through Lauda, of all people based originally on Dyson, that there are traces of inherent meaning in one or two now um, abandoned, though not forgotten tongues, Old English and uh, Lombard, somehow connected to uh, Numenorean and uh, Adonaic. So the scientist read is distinguishing between or among the characteristics of different languages and to some extent differences in human nature because of different, uh, 
between or among different peoples. Okay. Um, did the words have meaning in themselves? Well, Lewis would say yes. Rand would say no. But there are significant differences between the meanings of words otherwise translatable into each other in the single uh, culture. Um, though the meaning may not be inherent in the language, the meaning of meaning may be said to be inherent in the relation of the language and human nature. That is, our words have meaning because we are human. That is what distinguishes our words from animal sounds. I can bring Owen Barfield to bear here. I'm thinking of his review of Julian James, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Mind by Campbell Mind, surely the oddest scholarly books written in the past years, and uh, Barfield's related research. Now, this was long after there was much connection between <coughs> Ronald Tolkien and Owen Barfield. We talk about the Inklings as though they were a continuing group, and that each of them, we see the Camp Barfield as a member, um, kept up with each other as a member. Um, Christopher Tolkien told me in 1987 that he had not seen Barfield more than half a dozen times since World War II, not because they were not friendly, but because Barfield said he wasn't in Oxford. And of course, the last 13 years, of course, at that time he wasn't in so Christopher was, but he wasn't in Oxford between 1946 and 1975, more than half a dozen times. Um, he was, I don't count, I, you know, Barfield's a kind of courtesy in uh, He was a friend of C.S. Lewis's, but there were other friends of C.S. Lewis who didn't count his part, and uh, he attended very few meetings, but his writing, was read by Tolkien long before the Wittlings, and by Lewis, and by others. So, an influence, yes, an inkling, I think, no. Um, now, Lewis considered the difference among the three Martian <coughs> languages in Out of the Silent Planet. Those of you who want to check the reference, you'll find it on page 114 of the uh, paperback edition, which I still have. So. In 1938, when Out of the Sun Planet was published, in 1943, when Lewis wrote the very different words about the great speech, uh, what happened amongst the Inklings? The interest in language and languages had not declined, but the man who was most interested in the relation of languages one to another, and perhaps even how language came to be, or these languages came to be as they were, was in London for the duration. A contributing factor, perhaps, to Lewis's uh, play language still exists in the natural course of events in our solar system, if not in our world, is that our transplantation was the language from before the fall. Now, I seem to see how my time is uh, showing here. Yeah, not too bad. Um, here's uh, how Lewis started off his comments in his uh, draft uh, of the uh, beginning of language and human nature. In a book like this, it might be expected that we should begin with the origins of language and to see thence to prehistoric language, to we come to ancient language and finally arrive at modern language. This method tends to give you the impression that things said in the later chapters are some things said in the earth. But in reality, we know a great deal about modern language and less about ancient, and anything we can say about prehistoric language can only be guessed. Therefore, begin with modern language. We begin then with an attempt to say what language is. A language, in the wise, wise sense, is a system of signs. But there is one such system of signs, so widely used, and so much richer than all the others, that it is generally called simply language. This is the system in which the signs are the various noises made by the human mouth. It is language in this sense which is the subject of the present book. But our definition is still too broad. We only see language in its full sense when the noises made are not only signs, but are intended to be signs by the person who makes them. This is sometimes expressed saying that language is a vocal noise with a meaning. This will do well enough for the body that we remember or distinguish the different senses 
of the word man. By this time, it seems to me to have qualified this message about so qualifications so that I'm not entirely sure what he's going to go on to say. And of course, he didn't go on to say it because he didn't finish it. Um, whereupon, we find ourselves in question of the meaning of meaning, the old I.A. Richards paradigm, which is essentially philosophical rather than scientific. Uh, we do have much of what Rand had to say on the line, which is relevant here, including a warning on restricting language to sound rather than to signs more general good ideographs. If Tolkien was dilatory, and perhaps he thought Lewis was being if not over the thought of these wrong couple, we can perhaps see just what the problem was with the Lewis collaboration by looking further at our third man thing. Um, not only reason for looking at Charles Wren, um, but He speaks of Chinese ideographs that have effectively no specific sound as yet being language. If language may exist in some sense without sound. For the ideographs of classic Chinese can, it is said, be read by any educated speaker of any of the multifarious and phonemically divergent regional dialects spoken in the Chinese Republic. For these characters convey the words entirely independent pronunciation, through the, though their exact shades of meaning must be continually changing. It is true that Lewis implicitly considers this point when discussing how it is that the Algela causes us to hear them. The difference is that Rand is considering human language and therefore language of human nature, while Lewis is considering, in essence, a kind of non-human use of language. But I think the point is at least is pertinent, though the fragment is not looked at. Tolkien, of course, was in trance by sound. His remarks on the um, beauty of the sound, sour door, have been often quoted. And this will actually be part of the, his view, according uh, to Sierra Thomas Munson, that languages uh, are the remarks of kids. The difference of sounds of orchish, but the speech is more of a kind of order. Why they thought the SEM press would be a good press for this. Uh, I would have thought myself either Faber and Faber, which was Williams' publisher, or Sheen and Ward, would, which had published Children's Regress, would have been. Sheen Ward was after all a Roman Catholic publisher, and uh, Tolkien was Roman Catholic, and probably might would not object there. But Faber and Faber. Yes, Elliot, therefore at that time out for Lewis, and when Gene Ward was right to go to Regress in 75, Lewis referred to them as a papist publisher and wrote disparagingly, uh, disparagingly of them in his uh, letters. I, I don't think Lewis or Tolkien had the publisher's connections to uh, find a publisher for the book at that time. Um, remember that Lewis's Publications were with Jeffrey Bless, which was a connection of Rainer Unwin, which was, or rather, uh, Sir Stanley Unwin, which was, it was given him by Tolkien, and Lewis, in fact, had had a horrendous time getting his stuff published, except, of course, by the Oxford University Press. Um, Rand, who published with Longman, published with Hutchinson like, University Library, perhaps from his academic politic, and with Tolkien knows it. Had to publish his connections. Um, the um, pastor not translation we mentioned suggested that the translation is human understanding. Not understanding within the language grouping, though of the culture within that grouping. Indeed, Ren notes in one passage that even Sanskrit, though itself an Indo European language along with its Indian ramification presents a pattern of thought which renders any sort of literal translation into a more European Indo European language a very limited I quote here Tom Shippey of Tolkien's view of language. But language. Um, see here, here's a passage from uh, Tolkien also essentially. 
Tolkien was the holder of several highly personal, if not a radical uh, views about language. He thought that people, perhaps as a result of their confused linguistic history, especially English people, could detect historic traffic in language without knowing how they did it. They knew that names like Oakthorpe and Stainby were Norse, Northern without knowing they were Norse. They knew Winchcombe and Cumbria would be the last without recognizing that the word Cumbria is well. They could feel the linguistics by words, along with this Tolkien belief, of course, the language is to be intrinsically attractive or intrinsically repulsive. But Tolkien also thought that the logic could take you back even beyond the ancient text that it studied. He believed that it was possible sometimes to feel one's way back from words as they survived in later periods to concepts which had long since vanished but which surely existed, or else the word was not. Contributed to its special character. This is immediately before the passage. Language is a natural human growth, partly moral and partly physical. It follows, therefore, that it never ceases to change, but is a continuing development in a constant state of flux. Shades of Owen Barfield. And add to the unresolved question of the nature of language and the nature of the relationship to human nature and of languages and human natures, Tolkien's increasing displeasure of his friends Dyson and Lewis as they went on becoming caricatures themselves as they aged. I think Ulysses' life went on a new world of Ulysses and Pentagon. And one will have virtually a perfect storm of reasons for the non-appearance of the non-collaboration. One thing I find very interesting. Charles Rabbit nearly blind, but he could see the Chinese egress for language of sight, while Lewis, who was sighted, and moreover created from pictures, rather than as Tolkien did from words, seems to have thought of words solely as sounds. Probably that had something to do with his inability of mathematical symbols. Um, somehow, I have noted over the years Tolkien fans have not necessarily shied away from science. <laughs> the uh, examples here. And uh, it occurred to me, for example, that the youngest member of the University of Wisconsin Tolkien Society, along with about 1980, was uh, actually was a member of the, Wisconsin Tolkien Society, the University of Wisconsin Tolkien Society without being old enough to the university, uh, eventually went on to get his bachelor's and his doctorate in human genomics at uh, um, Madison and at uh, <coughs> Berkeley, and then got a, uh, his law degree at Bull Hall, and is now the leading lawyer practicing in the question of the patenting of DNA and human genomic research. And uh, by the way, I know that just up from, or down the coast from him, there is uh, one of the leading uh, STEM entrepreneurs in this country with his venture capital firm, which is the Mistwell Venture Capital. <laughs> that Lewis and Tolkien intended to argue that language ability, particularly language invention, is precisely what distinguishes human nature from nature of other animals. 
Now, what has been called by a more recent student of language a genetic human predisposition or uh, uh, instruction for language is real, and the claim it is, that it must have come into being, if in time, by mutation or whatever you call it, either once in the same population of human homo sapiens, which the Sarsis suggested to me about 150,000 years ago, and was then passed on to all descendants, or emerging at various late times in separate offshoot populations. He, oh, this also argues that language, unlike eyes and flight, the other great evolutionary changes, had developed, that if it had developed separately and diversely, there would have been pockets of human beings without language. The scientific model of change I used in my own research is that presented by Dr. Stewart in his book Investigations about 10 years or 9 years ago. Even on a molecular level, this model brings us close to Pierce's um, meaning laden semiotic triad uh, science signifies significance. Dr. Kaufman suggests that this model leaves us with a set of four laws for four apparently different phase translate transitions of uh, what he calls co-evolutionary constructible uh, community, con uh, communities of autonomous agents. Law two, uh, I'll give two of you. Law two, a co assembling community of agents on a short time scale with respect to co evolution will assemble us to a self organized critical stage with some uh, uh, maximum a number of uh, species per uh, continuity. Then there will be a series of local extinction uh, events. Law four, uh, autonomous agents will evolve such that uh, casually, uh, causally uh, local uh, communities are on a generalized uh, superstructural, supercritical, subcritical boundary exhibiting a first uh, generalized self-organized critical average for the sustained expansion of the case possible that the phase state. In other words, <laughs> with this model, if language does not de develop, will be an avalanche of local extinctions and the community will cease to exist. Therefore, there will be no human communities without language. Now, as I read it, there was a fundamental change in kind some 35, 40,000 years ago during one of the intervals in the Wisconsin Ice Age when our ancestors, or some of them, uh, began to speak and uh, paint or draw. Uh, Julian James' book is highly controversial, but what he does suggest is, is that the uh, first words were uh, calls, modifiers, and commands, and eventually objects became the subjects, uh, the nouns, so to speak, until the eventual proper names, proper nouns, uh, developed perhaps 8,000 uh, years ago, about the time that human storytelling um, and it started, he suggests, with, uh, with death, with the content of death. Um, now it's curious, the uh, figurines that show the caves of drawings of Lascaux, and incidentally, very recently, uh, the cuts to lagmite circles in the uh, Brunichel cave, Reported in Nature back in uh, May, uh, would match 100,000 audio that our previous commentary suggested for origins of the language. These things and figures are, in some sense, religious. In any case, with what we um, know or suspect now, we can say, as I believe Lewis and Tolkien would have said then if they had the knowledge that language is. Different languages define the different nations of different peoples, and even that it is possible in the European Spain that certain languages, perhaps passing through the preserving north, might better keep at their heart a remembering of things past, including human nature past. Of course, neither they nor Rand would go as far as this. I may go along around, uh, my wife tells me too long. It is, but my definition of the scientific way, and that science leaves open of plain scientific truths, of being plain scientific truths, 
what Lewis and Tolkien called myth. Lewis and Paul Lewis's description of the Pentecostal visitations of the gods at St. Anne's, as an observer, as Pentecostal, my father was speaking, were daily, not suddenly drunk. Note that the areas of the brain involved in the creation of language are those differentially affected by alcohol, among alcoholics and non alcoholics. Note also that the symbol of Pentecost is the flame, and that recent work on big dreams and a good deal of work stemming from physiological research on young boys ties brain change to uh, dreams or visions of great bright light. I uh, can see work on language and human nature in accord with modern science, with Lewis and Tolkien, and with Wren's insistence on comparative and scientific study, but the English were too early to write it, and I am too inexpert. Good deal. I wonder if you would draw the comparison on the one hand between the genetic predisposition to develop language in the human history on the one hand, and on the other, the creation of a language by the in, in the creative imagination of J.R.R. Tolkien. I guess I would have to say that for those who create languages uh, and who make a uh, career of creating languages, that's a nice uh, call of it. Um, he had the bug, uh, so to speak, the, uh, the gene, whatever you want to call it. In, uh, in full measure. Um, I don't, the only test you could run would be to see what Hillary Tolkien had. He did have some inventive um, genius. Uh, he was brought up by the same people. He did have the same parents. Uh, I, I have a suspicion that this is one form that a Projects which in other forms might go to the creation of music might have. I note that uh, Tolkien's, uh, for Tolkien's cousins, uh, Hillary's children, have been involved with uh, music. And of course, the original Tolkien family in, uh, in England were manufacturers of pianos. That's a voice. But I can't, haven't done the scientific work necessary, nor can I uh, really comment on it. What I have can tell you is that uh, that predisposition seems to me to have some resemblance to uh, uh, might have some connection with, given the areas of the brain involved, to the predisposition to uh, alcoholism, to uh, a non-common uh, reaction to alcohol, which I have done some research for. <laughs> I don't have copy for that book. But your other books were for sale out there. Yes, the other books were for sale out there. A couple of copies. But uh, somehow I didn't think uh, my book, This Strange Illness on Alcoholism, would uh, uh, at 26.50 for a paperback of 103 pages, which is almost impenetrable. It would probably be a great seller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I'm asking you is the. Tolkien's creation.